But this raises ethical questions. How do you make a diagnosis of brain death? You have to be very sure the person is brain dead before taking their heart out. You're essentially removing any chance, obviously, that they can live. Um, should we force people to be organ donors? Or do we give people permission to say no? Is it ethical that some people say, I only want to take an organ, but I won't give an organ? You can see that there are, then there are some people who say, we don't accept brain death. Our religion says you're dead when your heart and lungs stop functioning. But the patient is on a vet respirator, their heart's pumping, their lungs are moving. Even though their brain is dead, people might say, we don't accept your definition. I'm just giving you some, some of the many, many, many examples of the ethical issues that arise as, as technology becomes more sophisticated. So organ transplantation raised a whole slew of ethical questions. Also, who gets the organ? We have far more people who need hearts or lungs than we have hearts or lungs available. How do you decide? How can you be fair and just? Should we only give it to famous and prominent people and rich people, or should we give it everybody is the same? How do you, how do you, uh, obviously we don't do that. We try to make it an equal playing field, but there are certain issues people who may not have health insurance, for example, who cannot pay for a transplant. Is it fair to deprive somebody without, uh, who doesn't have the money for it? On the other hand, if we didn't have a program that had enough money to work, the program would dissolve. We, money is necessary to pay the doctors and to pay for the machines, et cetera, et cetera. So you see how all of these, all of these issues, what about people from other countries who see America as a very sophisticated medical place? Should somebody come on the plane and come from any country and say, here I am, I'm dying of heart disease, give me a heart? Should Americans be first in line before people from other countries? So you see that there are all sorts of questions that did not exist when I was an intern, and hence the need for this whole discipline of medical ethics and who gets to make these decisions. In addition to that, we, we have a whole area called assisted reproductive technology. People who, couples or individuals who are infertile want to have babies. And the first so-called test tube baby was born years ago. That person is now an adult. It was a person who was conceived in, in England. What is a test tube baby? It's where sperm is obtained from a man and an egg is taken out of a woman. Obviously, it's much more difficult to get an egg out of a woman than it is to get sperm from a man. The sperm and the egg are put together in a petri dish, fertilization occurs, and the uh, embryo is allowed to grow into a number of cells, and at a certain point in the development of that embryo, that embryo is then placed into the uterus of a healthy woman, and that embryo can become a healthy baby. This is assisted reproductive technology, or what they used to call test tube babies. Well, now we have become so sophisticated that we can test that embryo to see if that embryo has certain genetic diseases. And we cannot transplant, we cannot implant the embryo with the genetic disease. We can select the healthy embryo. But this raises other questions. What about if somebody says, I only want you to implant the boy embryo. I don't want a girl embryo. Should we listen to that person? Should people use that right? What if a person says there are we have there are situations where people who have congenital deafness. There are some people who are born deaf. Now, deaf people have a whole culture of their own, not their sign language. They tend to live together. There are even schools where only deaf people go to. And there are some couples who have said, we only want an embryo that has a deaf baby. We don't want a baby who can hear because we want our baby to be part of our world. Is it ethical for me as a doctor to implant only the deaf baby and not and to discard the babies who can hear because that is the request of the parents. What about circumstances when you have a woman who says, I want to have a baby, I want to bear a baby, I want, uh, and the woman is 63 years old, say, and she says, take the egg from my neighbor's daughter, I like her, she's lovely, she's willing to give the egg, I'm paying her $50,000 for it, and I'm going to take the sperm from, you know, so-and-so, who's a lovely guy, and I know him, and I think that's going to make, and I want to be able to bear a baby, and you give me that, and, and we can technically give a woman who is after menopause hormones 
to make her uterus receptive to an egg, to an, to an embryo, and a woman can give birth at the age of, in, in her 60s. It's actually happened. Is that ethical? Is it ethical? Some people say, well, it's okay. If a man is 95, he can impregnate a woman, so why should we place uh, obstacles for a woman? Well, you can't pass a law saying that men 95 can't have children, but if you're coming to me to ask me to facilitate having a woman in her 60s having a child, I may reserve the right to say no for whatever ethical reasons I think there might be. I'm putting you case after case after case of the sorts of difficult issues that our very sophisticated technology leads to. I'm not giving you answers, by the way. I'm giving you the questions. The answers are obviously a lot more difficult than it may, uh, and it may vary. Then we get into types of questions which don't have so much to do with technology, but questions to do with capacity. What happens if you have a person who is psychotic, who is, who's got mental illness, who is seeing things and hearing things, and that person needs to have an operation or a treatment to save their life, but that person says, no, I don't want you to operate on me for my appendicitis because if you do, you'll let the blue men inside my abdomen and they will eat me up. Do we let that person die if they have ruptured appendix when a simple appendectomy can cure their life? Or do we force them, coerce them, sedate them, and take them to the operating room against their wishes in order to do the appendectomy? Does a person who has psychosis have autonomy? Do they have the right of saying yes or no? Is it absolute? Is it limited? Et cetera, et cetera. What if a person with psychosis says, I don't want chemotherapy for my, for my cancer? Well, chemotherapy is a much bigger deal than an appendectomy, which is a one-time affair. Chemotherapy may go on for weeks or months. Can we coerce somebody each time that they have to come in to get their chemotherapy? Do we let them die of their disease? These are questions, again, that we face on a regular basis. What about people who have Alzheimer's disease, people who are demented, who may have a medical problem, um, and who cannot say uh, that, let's say we have somebody without any relatives. We see this sometimes, people who are homeless or just happen to be in a circumstance where they have no close relatives. Are we the ones to make the decision for that person with dementia? Do we have the right? to make the yes and no. What if it's a tough decision that there's no clear, easy answer? Who gets to decide the yes, the no, and the maybe? So again, you see the whole host of types of questions. And as our technology expands, and as our population becomes more old and so forth, the questions, I can guarantee you one thing. Maybe I haven't told you the answers to any of my questions, but I do have one statement I can guarantee you, and that is, that the field of medical ethics is not going away. It will become more relevant and more relevant because there is no stop to the advancement of medical technology. It's expanding at, a, at an explosive rate. And, we, and the more power that we have over disease and over illnesses and over birth and life and death, the greater and more frequent will be the ethical questions. And then it's a question of, well, whose ethics? What makes medical ethics? Moses did not receive the Ten Commandments of medical ethics from God at Mount Sinai. We have things you should not steal, you should not murder, etc., etc. Who gets to say what medical ethics, what's really ethical? 